Greetings, physics enthusiasts. Welcome to AP Physics One, the unit on sound, lesson five. And this is the last lesson on sound. So we're making some progress. Today, I wanna to talk to you about what happens when there are two sources of sound. So often, that's uh, that happens when we have a stereo system. If I have uh, a speaker and then I have an additional speaker and they are each sources of sound. What happens when this sound wave and this sound wave both travel out to some location? How is that sound experienced? So when we have two sources of sound, in order for this discussion that we're going to have to, uh, to work, the two sources of sound have to be emitting the same sound at the same time. Let me demonstrate that. So this represents a sound wave traveling along, and this also represents a sound wave. What are some things that we notice about these two sound waves? First thing we notice is they have the same wavelength. This length, the wavelength, is the same as this length, the wavelength. In order for two sounds to interact the way we're going to talk about today, they have to be of the same wavelength. They also have to, to be in sync. So if source one is emitting a crest and then a trough and a crest and a trough, this second source cannot start by emitting a trough and then a crest and then a trough. They have to be in sync. They have to start out crest, crest. So for that to happen, we need these two conditions in order for all of today's stuff to work. Two conditions. My two waves um, have to be in phase, which means they both start off with crests and then they both go to troughs. Another word for that is coherent. Pardon me. Um, so uh, in phase or coherent. And the other thing is they have to have the same wavelength. So for sound, that means they have to be the same pitch, you know, um, you know, and they have to be the same note. It can't, this wave and this note wouldn't work because those are different frequencies. Uh, next year, when you take AP Physics 2, we're going to talk about waves again, but we'll talk about light waves. And so those light waves, in order for today's phenomenon to happen, also have to be in phase, and we call that coherent. They also have to have the same wavelength, but instead of calling that the same note, we're going to say they have to have the same color. Different wavelengths of light have different color. So that's just something to get used to for next year. And the vocabulary word for the same color is monochromatic. Mono meaning one, chromatic meaning color. So the, the two uh, waves have the same wavelength or the same color, one color. All right. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about these two waves. And it might make sense to say, well, this source of sound is playing over there. And then this source of sound is playing over there. And the two speakers each send sound to me. And there would be what we call constructive interference. This sound plus this sound gives louder sound. But what if for some reason that speaker's a little farther away and that speaker's a little closer? So one of the speakers would have to travel, the, the wave from that one would have to travel farther to get to me, which would make it get to me a little behind. And if one of the waves got behind it, because it had to travel farther, look, this crest and this trough line up and this trough and this crest line up and this crest and this trough line up. If this wave got behind by exactly half a wavelength, if we got here, if we started like this and it got behind by a whole wavelength, we would have constructive interference. But if we only got behind by 
half a wavelength, we have what's called destructive interference. So that's the big idea. We have these two conditions, and if they're met, check, check, then we can talk about interference. And if one of them gets behind, one gets behind by a half of a wavelength, destructive interference. But if one gets behind by a whole wavelength, then we have constructive interference. So again, this represents sound traveling through space to get to me. Great. If there's another sound of the same wavelength that starts off just like that one, both with a crest, and they travel the same distance and they get to me, I'm going to experience something louder. But if one of them got behind by a half of a wavelength, that's going to give me destructive interference, and I might hear no sound at all, or I might hear significantly quieter sound. And then we could continue being behind by a whole wavelength, constructive, a wavelength and a half, destructive, two wavelengths, constructive. So we could expand this condition to any integer number of wavelengths. If we're behind by one, two, three, four, five, or even zero wavelengths, I get constructive interference. And if I'm behind by any integer plus one half, zero plus a half, one plus a half, two and a half, all of those possibilities will give me destructive interference. Okay, a little bit of vocabulary, and then we'll do some examples. Um, this destructive interference is sometimes called producing a minimum in intensity or a minimum in loudness. Constructive interference is sometimes called, going to be consistent and use the green here, maximum intensity. or maximum loudness. So maximum or max, minimum or min go with constructive and destructive interference. And constructive interference means one wave got behind by an integer number of wavelengths, one, two, three, four, five. Destructive interference or a minimum means one wave got behind by an integer plus one half, one and a half wavelengths, two and a half wavelengths, three and a half wavelengths, or just one half wavelength. So that's the big idea here. Now, one more vocabulary word is path difference. Path difference. So I said, if those two speakers out there are equidistant from me, the path difference is zero. Nobody gets behind. N equals zero. I have constructive interference. But if one of them is a little farther away, maybe a half of a wavelength, then the one that's farther away emits waves that have to travel farther. The one that's closer emits waves that don't have to travel as far to get to me. So if these ones have to travel a distance x and these ones have to travel a distance y, neither x nor y is what matters. It's the difference between x and y. And we call that the path difference. Maybe I'll call those two distances D2 and D1. And the difference, remember you learned in elementary school probably that difference means subtract. The difference in those two distances is called the path difference. Now, in Greek, the letter that makes the D sound is delta. And you've probably seen capital delta and now there's lowercase delta. So the difference in those two distances is lowercase delta. 
and that's my path difference. Path difference is delta. So to write that using different vocabulary now, if delta equals an integer number of wavelengths, I get constructive interference. If delta is an integer plus one and a half number of wavelengths, that gives me destructive interference. What's another word for constructive interference? Maximum intensity. What's another word for destructive interference? Minimum intensity. Make sense? I hope. So let's do, and we might even get to two examples. Let's do one or two examples, depending on how time works and uh, see how this plays out. So what number have I said I wish to do? I'm going to look at number 32 here in my book. So lots of uh, interference of sound waves, constructive interference or destructive interference. So let's look at number 32 here. Can I zoom in? I can. Two loudspeakers are placed above and below one another as in figure 1415. We'll turn the page and look at that later if we need to. And they're driven by the same source at a frequency of 500 hertz. That means that they have the same frequency. And if they're driven by the same source, that means that they start, crest together, trough together, crest together, trough together. They're coherent. What minimum distance should the top speaker be moved back in order to create destructive interference? So let's look at this picture. 14, 15, and see what the geometry of the situation is. Because they're obviously talking about a specific setup. Is that it? Yes, there we go. So here's picture 14, 15. Two speakers are placed three meters apart one above the other. Oops, hold the page. What minimum distance should the top speaker be moved back in order to create destructive interference between the speakers? The same source. Okay. So we're going to take our two speakers and we're going to move one back to create destructive interference. Very good. Which is similar to the problem there. Anyway, we've got our two speakers, one above the other. We're going to move one of them back. Interesting. They don't say anything about where the listener is going to stand. create destructive interference between the speakers. And if the top speaker is moved back twice that far, will there be constructive or destructive interference? I'm not sure I love that. Let's just draw some pictures and see what we think is going on. Sometimes it's hard to picture. So there's a speaker. And there's another speaker. And they want us to move one of the speakers back. So it's not going to be there anymore. Now it's going to be moved back some distance. And we don't know how far we're going to move it back. So that's the answer to the question. X equals how far? I can show you the question one more time. Two loudspeakers are placed above and below one another and are driven at the same frequency, 500 hertz. What distance should the top speaker be moved back in order to create destructive interference? And remember, destructive interference means the path difference is a half a wavelength or one and a half or two and a half wavelengths, but they want the minimum distance. So I've got two speakers like this. And I think what they're 
they don't really care much about this, uh, this exact distance here. They're just placed one above each other, like in that picture. Now, uh, at the beginning of all the problems in the book, so here's number one. What did it say before number one? What did it say before number one? Unless otherwise stated, use 345 meters per second as the speed of sound in air. Did this problem state another speed? No, it did not. So we're going to use the speed 345. And that's something to be really careful about. Other textbooks might have a different number, like 343 or 340. So be careful if you're doing problems from another book that you use whatever speed they said. So uh, speed is wavelength times frequency. The speed is 345, and that equals the wavelength, which I don't know, times the frequency, and they told us in the problem the frequency was 500 hertz. So now I can solve that for wavelength. It's just going to be 345 divided by 500. 345 divided by 500 gives us 0 0.69. 0 0.69 meters, about that far, 69 centimeters. So that's the wavelength. So look what's gone on here. I've just moved one speaker back. So I've moved one speaker back. If I'm gonna move a speaker back, so I have destructive interference or a minimum, well, I have to have moved it back in plus one half wavelengths. And let's say what minimum distance, so that's gonna to correspond to N equals zero. Minimum distance I have zero plus one half times the wavelength equals delta. Right? So I've got some listener over here, some person who's listening. It doesn't even matter how far this person is. I can say this distance, how far are they? I don't know, F. So one of the distances, D1, is F. This goes over to here, a distance F. This, D2, is F plus X, however far I moved the speaker back. Delta is D2 minus D1, which is F plus X, there's D2, minus D1 F, which is F minus F is zero, which delta is X. So the path difference is how far I'm moving that one back. So I want one half of the wavelength, 0 0.69, to be equal to delta, which is x. That's how far we're going to move it back. So half of 0.69 is 0. I think it's 0.345. Did I do that right in my head? 0.69, enter, divide by 2. Yes, 0.345. 0 0.345 meters. And there's our answer. Let's look at the question again to make sure we addressed it. What minimum distance should the top speaker be moved back in order to create destructive interference? There we go. B, if the top speaker is moved back twice that distance, will there be constructive or destructive interference? In other words, we move the top speaker back half a wavelength. Let me get that better in the picture. We move the top speaker back a half a wavelength to get destructive, we move it twice as far back and it gives us constructive interference. So for part B, the answer would be constructive interference. Make sense? So I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, ask me about it in class. That was number 32 in your textbook. Uh, should I do one more? I think I have time for one more.
Ah, uh, yes. Let's do, this is, this is one of the problems that's assigned for this week. Don't worry about it. I'll just do it here. Let's look at number 37. Two speakers are driven by a common oscillator at 800 hertz, and they face each other. So this sound emits sound toward me, and this speaker emits sound toward me, and those sounds come together. Ooh. Um, locate the points where we would have relative minima of the amplitude. All right. So where, so if I have a speaker here, and I have another speaker here, where would I expect relative minima? Where would I expect destructive interference? Does it say how far apart they are? Uh, they're a distance of 1.25 meters apart. So this is 1.25 meters. And I have an 800 hertz sound and an 800 hertz sound. Uh, so same wavelength. And it says they are uh, driven by the same oscillator, meaning crests together, troughs together. Now, what they're saying is where, someplace in between here, some, I don't know where, so I'm just going to draw a random place. I want minimum intensity, which means I want destructive interference. It said minimum intensity, right? Relative minima would occur. So, so how do I find this location X? Well, if this distance is X, is it obvious that this distance, we're not gonna call it Y, if this is X and this is 1.25, this is 1.25 minus X. So again, this is uh, D2, this is D1. One sound travels this distance, another sound travels this distance. Delta, the path difference, is due D2 minus D1. So delta, the path difference, is 1.25 minus X, D2, minus X, or 1.25 minus 2X. Delta is 1.25 minus 2x. But if I want a minimum, then I want delta to be n plus 1 half times lambda. So I want delta 1.25 minus 2x to equal n plus 1 half times delta. What's the wavelength? Speed is wavelength times frequency. Speed 345 is wavelength times 800. So wavelength is 345 over 800. 345 over 800. We don't even have to get to our calculator yet. We could just put that in there. Now, how many variables are in this equation? Well, there's two. There's N and there's X. X is what I'm trying to find. And n isn't so much a variable as it is an index. n is zero, which would give me a path difference of a half wavelength. It's one, which gives me a path difference of one and a half wavelengths. It's two and three and so on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug in zero for n and then solve for x. And that's gonna tell me one place where I have a minimum. Then I'm going to plug in one for n, so this will be one and a half, and solve for x again, and that'll give me another place. Then I'm going to plug in two for n, and just do that a few times and see how it goes. So I'm going to do this twice for you and leave the rest for you to do on your own. So 1.25 minus 2x equals zero plus one half times 345 over 800. 345 over 1600. Do you see it? That's when n equals zero. When n equals one, I get 1.25 minus 2x equals one and a half or three halves 
times 345 over 800. Three halves times 345 over 800. That makes this 1600. And three times 345, I think is 1035. 1035. Does that make sense? And then these two equations are easy to solve for x. There's multiple answers here. This distance, this distance, this distance. How did the problem tell us there would be multiple answers? Locate the points along a line. So there are going to be multiple locations where I have a minimum or destructive interference or quiet. So there you go. That is what I have for um, lesson five in the sound unit. I hope it's making sense. If you have questions, you also know that I love to answer those in class. So have yourself a great day. And remember, don't break the laws of physics.